uh, we have saved the uh, last recognition tonight uh, as a place of special honor. Um, after three decades of this event, recognizing incredible leaders and incredible nonprofits, incredible companies across the state, a few years ago, we saw a need to recognize or create a, a unique honor that recognized an individual who has distinguished herself or himself over a course of a lifetime in a uniquely uh, powerful way with their specific leadership. I think we can all acknowledge that the world is full. We see them all over uh, the media and other uh, ways that we engage, that there are a lot of leaders across this country that perhaps aren't doing things in a way that is honorable. We established the legacy of leadership honor a few years ago to recognize those who have not only done well in business, but also who have led with character and have made a unique impact on this state that has transcended any one single business moment. Um, only five other people in our state have, uh, have been given this legacy of leadership recognition. And they are uh, some names that you are going to recognize. Uh, and tonight, joining this group is Mr. Joe Ford. Preceding Mr. Ford is Simmons Bank Executive Tommy May, who was recognized in 2019. KFC franchisee and banker from Northwest Arkansas, Northeast Arkansas, rather, Mr. Wallace Fowler. Uh, businesswoman and philanthropist John L. Hunt was recognized in 2021. Sherman Tate was recognized the year after for an impact that has been profound and long lasting. And last year's honoree, Mr. Mac McClarty, uh, was recognized for his lifetime of incredible impact in Arkansas and in this country and across the, the globe. And all of those men and women have led in, in meaningful ways with their organization, but have led with character and compassion. And we are thrilled tonight to, to recognize Mr. Joe Ford. I would at this time like to invite to the stage uh, Mr. Uh, Ford's son uh, and business colleague, Scott Ford, uh, to the podium to say a few words about tonight's honoree, about Mr. Ford's impact on our state, and then... That will be followed by a tribute video to Mr. Ford, and then we'll hear from Mr. Ford in just a minute. Scott is the co-founder and CEO of West Rock Coffee. Prior to founding West Rock, he served as president and CEO of Alltel Corporation. He began his professional career as an investment banker and subsequently served as the assistant to the chairman at Stevens Group, where his work involved uh, traditional investment banking services, equity portfolio management, venture capital investing, and acquisitions in the media industry. Ladies and gentlemen, make welcome Mr. Scott Ford. Good evening. What a great group. Um, the honorees, the, uh, the various participants that were acknowledged, uh, you saw it when people came up entrepreneurs and the teams that work around them leave more on the field in business than is possible to imagine if you hadn't been through it. And their spouses feel it, and their families feel it, and their kids feel it, and this is what it takes to build a business from nothing. It's interesting, though, to see the group that came up tonight. You, you can see the emotions just under the surface, right? Uh, and you go, where do they get... Where do they get the will to keep going? Because it always goes against you. There's always something going wrong. It's always easier to just get a job and quit. And they don't, and they just persevere and persevere. Joe Ford is a great example of that. I've had the privilege to work with him in one business he built and then to build another business with him from scratch. And it is a relentless, daily pursuit of getting better, holding the team together and et cetera. And I think when they asked me last week, I was really just gonna come and have the chicken dinner and 
you know, watch and clap and, and um, listen to him speak. And then they said, uh, he, he asked if you'd introduce him. I said, oh, well, okay. Introduced your father uh, for the Leadership of Legacy Award. What a great honor. So I was thinking about it, and I thought, you know, there's just no way to do it superficially. And so I'm just going to tell you the truth. So Joe Ford, those of you, Joe Ford is a well-known guy and an easy-to-like guy. But Joe Ford was the third of three brothers born in the Depression. And the first two boys didn't make it out of poverty because that's real life, and poverty grates on children. Lack of basic medical care, you know, uh, lack of basic functioning medical care cost both of, both of his brothers their lives at an early age. And it would have been easy as a parent who just lost your, your, your first two children back to back uh, in a couple of year period, it'd be easy to quit. Be easy to just say life isn't fair. Be easy to be bitter. I think I would struggle with that. And his parents never gave in to that. And they taught him what optimism looks like, what perseverance looks like, what faith looks like, not when things are good, but when things are really, really hard. And they raised a man who is supremely confident and yet unbelievably, truly, from his heart, not fake like me, humble. <laughs> Y'all want to get up here and do this? You come on. <laughs> he knows his own mind, and he's perfectly willing to let you have yours, even if you're wrong. He is an optimist, not like just superficially, though. He is an optimist who is deeply prayerful over his people and the projects he's involved with. And he works at it in every level, relationally, spiritually, intellectually, every day. And he's all about other people. That's, that's, those are the three things. When his, uh, when his parents passed away, his father, Archford, who spent his career desegregating the school system from 1957 to 1983, he, uh, when he passed away, my grandfather and my grandmother had put on their, uh, on their tombstone, which is next to their two children. And on their children's tombstones, it says, the children of Arch and Ruby Ford. This is real life. And on their tombstones, after watching him come up, get an education, create a business, serve in public office, try to be a blessing back to his community, you know what they put on theirs? The parents of Joe T. Ford. I introduce to you the grown child of Arch and Ruby Ford, the best man I've ever met. What he really is, is he is an investor in other people who needs nothing back from you. That's his magic. I'm Joe Ford, chairman of West Rock Coffee Company. I'm the third of three boys in my family. The first two died young, two and a half and seven. They never made it through the depression. I loved economics. It's uh, what makes this country operate. And I came back, my dad at that time was commissioner of education. And I came back and told him how much I loved economics, what I was learning, and why did we not teach that in high schools? And he got Dr. Bessie Moore involved and uh, put in economics teaching in high schools. And now Arkansas is recognized as one of the top states of teaching economics to high school students. In December of 1958, Christmas break from university. I put on the only suit I have, and I, my mother said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go meet Mr. Stevens. And she said, do you know him? And I said, no. Do you have an appointment? And I said, no. Came down to his office, the receptionist asked me the same questions. I gave her the same answers. She called him, he said, come on up. And I introduced myself, I said, Mr. Stevens, I have no money. My family has no money. I graduate in a few months. I'd like to be in business. I'd like to be successful. 
you've been successful. Would you take any time and give me advice? He said, sit down. He found out I had to go to the Army, ROTC. He said, when you get back from that and want to go to work, come see me. I came back from the Army, went to work for my father-in-law and his brother-in-law that had a little phone company, and they weren't making any money. They bought the Grant County phone company from the Stevens family. And I said, they have to put some equity in this business or they're going to be gone shortly. And he said, how much equity do you think you need? I said, well, I think if I had a million dollars, I said, I believe I can make this thing work. And he said, you've got the million, just like that. And uh, we'd, we'd buy another company, we'd expand, we'd grow a little bit more and do all that. And all of a sudden, we ended up with a sizable company. We created a lot of opportunities for people. We always wanted a culture based on integrity. Treat people the way you would like to be treated. Treat everyone with respect. And people work as a team. With that culture involved, you can be very successful. Jack Stevens was the biggest help anybody could ever be. Joe is a builder. He has been an incredible builder throughout his career, and he is one of the few builders I've ever met and been blessed to be around who actually integrates family, relationships, and building for both his family, the employees of the business, and the ultimate stakeholders, the investors. He is an incredible example. I've never seen anybody like him. He loves people. He loves, he sent a hundred kids to college. A waitress who's having a hard day. You know, what do you, well, I'm trying to go to nursing school. Well, let me send you to nursing school. A hundred of them, all over the country, right? He invests in people and needs nothing emotionally, needs nothing back from them. And that's super, super rare. And it's unbelievably attractive to people who are presented the opportunity to have him invest in their lives. I worked around great investors he is one of the great American builders I've ever experienced. And I have met a lot of people. The guiding theme was he sees more in people sometimes than they see in themselves. He sees more in a business situation sometimes than the investors or the operators see. Altel was a small company when he became the CEO. He actually uh, worked with the Stevens family on growing it by obtaining capital. Joe understood how capital and aspiration and commitment to customers and understanding businesses could reward employees and investors. So Altel's journey, when I joined, it was a multi-billion dollar business in 1996. We had four divisions. By the time we were done, we were, a, we were sold for $28 billion. All along that journey, Joe built relationships, was on other boards of directors, was on the business roundtable, had his family, grew up, grew up beautiful family. He is always building something because he sees what something can be. I would say it's the story of an American builder bringing all the things together. And so yes, Altel is his story. That platform had to be put in place and he is the guy that did it. If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. That's the same way in life. No one gets to be successful without someone helping along the way. People have helped me in life. Jack Stevens, Stevens family, the employees that worked with me, that believed in the culture and what we were doing. I want to thank each of them, every single one of them, for helping me. I think that what I would like to say is that a kid from Wooster, Arkansas can be an example of what can happen in someone's life. I've been blessed. I've tried to do my best. I thank everyone that's helped me, and I hope that everybody else gets help that they need, encouragement that they need, wish for them the very best in their life, and if I can ever help anybody, I'd love to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, make welcome Mr. Joe Ford. Yes, sir. We do one photo.
Here we go. Yes, sir. Mitch, thank you very much. I'm like that turtle you see on fence posts. You know it did not get there by itself. Tonight I'm going to mention some people that helped me and us and our team and our family get on that fence post. I want to thank Arkansas Business for the work you do for your paper. It's a great service. I enjoy reading it. I want to recognize all the honorees tonight. Congratulations. I start with Jack Stevens that I referred to here. My family has done business with the Stevens family for 80 years. It started in 1943 with a handshake with Jack and Whit Stevens. It continued on with Warren and with his cousin Whit. It continued on to the new younger generation in Miles and John and Laurel and Whitty. It started with a handshake. We still operate that way. They are relationship bankers and not bankers that just rely on getting a fee. And we've had a relationship with them for 80 years. Would not take for it. Jack helped me several times. You saw when he invested a million dollars. Now I showed him the financial information that I'm showing you right now, which was nothing. And he said, I'll give you a million dollars. I think that was in 1962. Two or three years later, I went back to him and I said, Jack, we bought a little company. I need to borrow a million dollars. He said, who do you want to borrow it from? I said, I don't care. Anybody that loaned it to me. He said, how about union planters in Memphis? And I said, I don't know anybody there. Well, he said, I do. So he called the chairman, whose name was John Brown. Mr. Brown's assistant said, well, I'm sorry he's upstairs in the executive dining room having lunch. And Jack said, well, that's okay. I'll just hold while you go get him. <laughs> I knew then I was in the right place. <laughs> Scott worked with Stevens Company for some 10 years. And Warren and his team, Kirk Bradbury, and all the team helped us make acquisitions for many, many years, still do. Uh, you don't overlook people that are that good to you. Jack called me one day and he said, Joe, I'm going to do you a favor. I said, well, okay, what's that? You've done me plenty. Scott had been working for him for 10 years and Jack said, Eight of those years, I actually worked direct with Jack. And, and Jack said, I know Scott is a businessman better than you do. And he said, he needs to come out and join you at the phone company. He needs to be a senior officer. And he needs to be on the board. We had lunch and talked. And he said, and if you don't mind, I'm going to call some of your directors and tell them what I think. I said, well, Jack, you're my biggest shareholder. You call anybody you want to. <laughs> Thank goodness he did. And he created a wonderful relationship for Scott and me in, uh, in doing business. And he's a wonderful guy to work with. You saw that Jack invested a million dollars with us. I think that was 1962. He called me to, he said, I'm going to give you Scott. I'm going to let him go and let him come to you. That's a real friend. Scott spent 13 years with us. Shareholders' value increased 19%, increased compounded each year at 13 years. The second best company in our industry to us grew at 6%. I went to visit Jack in 2005, shortly before he died. And Jack said to me, Joe, he said, most of the money I've made, I made by betting on people. He didn't tell me who he meant, but I knew some of them. I first met him in 1958. This is in 1955. And then he said, I bet on you the first day we met. What a compliment. 
Now a little bit about West Rock Coffee. Scott and Didi were helping the orphans in Rwanda after the genocide, killed roughly a million men. Scott went down, I think they wanted him to build a library or a school or something, he thought he should go look. President Kagame heard he was there, invited him to dinner. I'm condensing a lot of this. Scott thought it'd be a dinner for an hour and it was five hours. They talked about a lot of things. They talked about three freedoms, religious, political, and economic. And President Kagame said, what do I have to do to attract capital to rebuild this country? I don't know all the conversation, but Scott said, private property, no corruption, not even $5 at the dock. President Kagame said, I can give political freedom and I can give religious freedom, which I will do. And when the poorest of the poor taste the fruits of economic freedom, they will never accept anything less. And will you help me teach my people economic freedom? And Scott said yes. When we sold the phone company, the million dollars that Jack invested in 62, we sold the phone company, I think, in 07 for right at $29 billion. Scott goes back down to Rwanda's having coffee. And the president told him, he said, we've investigated you, your family, you're free to invest in anything here you want to. Railroads, water systems, power systems, whatever you want to do, you can do, you're free to do. But he had a cup of coffee and he was sitting with a guy named Matt Smith. And Matt is here tonight because I've talked to him. He was there, I, I think, on a you know, visitation deal and helping out a church or something. He and Scott got to talking, had coffee at lunch, and Scott said, gee, this is good coffee. Where's it come from? He said, right here. Hmm. So Scott started doing more checking. And Matt told him that there was a coffee mill that the bank owned that bid it out twice. No one had bid on it. So Scott asked Matt, and I've heard Scott say this, he, Matt is from Texas, and Scott said, I knew he was highly qualified because his dad's an electrician in Texas. So he said, what do you think that would cost to buy that mill if they bid it out? And he said, oh, a million and a half. And Scott said, go bid it out, tell them. They did. We have to be high bidder. Scott saw women in Rwanda carrying babies on their back, just trying to feed their kids, make a living. He found out that the two people there before we got there were paying less than half of the world market price for coffee, taking it from those people that were literally starving. I'm gonna tell you one story, a story about Emma. A man that Scott knows in Rwanda wanted him to meet Emma. She had two washing stations to sell. A peanut has a hard shell and then a soft shell. A coffee bean only has the soft shell. A washing station is located so the farmers can come and sell their coffee. They can't travel long distances. And so they're scattered around fairly close to where the farmers are. Scott said, how much do you want for? She said $600,000, 300 each. I have to tell you that in Rwanda, a mortgage really does you no good. You have a business, you pledge your assets in your building, and you can't pay off the debt. Of course, they take what you pledged. The balance of the debt comes to you personally. And so when she said that, Scott said, there's another story. You have to tell me the rest of the story. She said she and her husband came to Rwanda with only the clothes on her back from Uganda. They stopped in a rural area to try to find work to make enough money to buy food. She found out that the two buyers of coffee before we showed up were paying a higher price in Kigali than they were paying in the rural areas. They'd be paying more for coffee here than they would be in North Little Rock or Maumelle. That incensed Scott. 
He said, I'm going to buy you two washing stations. I'm going to pay you $600,000 for them. But you have to work for me. I'll pay you full commissions to bring me coffee. And I said, no, I won't do that. He said, what will you do? She said, I will work for you free till you get your money back. He said, maybe 15 years. I'll work for you free 15 years. Well, Scott, she had bought two petrol stations. She had gotten into the coffee business. Coffee went from a dollar to three dollars. She couldn't hedge, went back to a dollar and a quarter. Scott, when she, he realized what she had done, that's where she owed the $600,000. Scott loaned her personal money. She bought more petrol stations. She paid him back. She sent her two kids to the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. Both have graduated. A mechanical engineer, Douglas Gamardi, and I, I didn't see Douglas before. I think he's supposed to be here. Douglas, are you here? Okay. Thank you, Douglas. That's Emma's son. And her daughter interned for us for two summers, and I think she's in Dallas. Douglas, thank you. That's how you change lives. I'm un I understand Emma financially does very well nowadays. She's back in the coffee business. She has more petrol stations, and we do all her hedging for all of her transactions. So we're going to try to make sure she doesn't lose money, and I think she's doing very well. Now, when we started the coffee business, we had worked with banks I had for over 40 years. Not a single bank that we had made millions of dollars for would loan us money for the coffee business. I heard honorees up here tonight, two different occasions, mention First Security Bank helped them. I'm here to tell you the only bank that would help us was First Security Bank. When Scott started buying coffee and brought it over, then we had to sell it. You might be surprised to know that the first company that helped us was an Arkansas company called Walmart. They've been helping us ever since. We appreciate that. The other company that helped us, Arkansas company as well, First Security. So I want to thank Randy and John Rutledge and JC and all their team because the plant in North Little Rock is here because of First Security Bank. The plant being built in Conway, a $300 million plant is here because of First Security. And when they showed the Conway Hospital up here earlier, I was born in Conway. Scott said, were you born here? I said, yeah, but it was the older building. <laughs> I'll tell you about the plant in Conway. It's on schedule. We're testing right now. We have contracts out for the full capacity of the plant. We need some more people from Arkansas to come and join us and work with us. And the last situation I'll meant of helping put me on a post, in other words, of people helping you, I have to thank Larry Barnes. In October of 2021, I got up one morning, felt a big knot here, sent him a picture. He called me and immediately said, get to the hospital as quick as you can. And I did. Hamlet's had to get me. I couldn't even get up sitting in a chair. I go out there and they're putting needles in my arms and one doctor says, well, you didn't get here any too early. I knew I was in trouble, but I didn't know what he meant. I stayed in the hospital a few weeks. I had three surgeries in six days, six hours, three hours, and five hours. Another surgery two weeks later. But the doctors and the nurses saved my life. I don't know all the names, but I'm grateful to each of them. And I want to thank each of them, and particularly thank Larry Barnes. 
Many of you know Digger Phelps. He coached basketball at Notre Dame for years. Now it's on ESPN basketball. Digger and I have been friends. When Digger found out I was sick in October of 19, I mean 2021, Digger Phelps, every Tuesday since that time, goes to the grotto at Notre Dame, lights a candle, says a prayer for me, and calls me to tell me he's done it. And the last time he did that was yesterday. He's done that every Tuesday since October of 2021. That is somebody helping you. The last thing I have to do is mention my family. I'm like some of you. I lost my spouse a few months ago. But my family and friends have been helping me. It's a hard time. Some of you know that. She walked side by side with me 64 years. And I thank each of them for their help. So I am like that turtle on a fence post. I didn't get there by myself, but I thank everyone that helped me. Thank you. Well done. Right here.